which was a high, kind of a high-level overview of what's kind of current. Um, Hardeep was also uh, like advances and kind of the evolution, and mine is also kind of an evolution story. But hopefully, mine will demonstrate that things have got easier, not more complicated, um, because of all the work done at these other places. So I'm going to talk about kind of current trends in natural language processing, um, but in particular motivated by a, the paper which uh, Hardeep mentioned, which came out like a week ago from OpenAI. So I, I was also planning on talking about something else, but that could wrap, be wrapped into this same story. So here we go. So um, hope, well, hopefully, if you've been to one of these before, you, you kind of know who I am. So um, I have a background in this machine learning thing. Um, with startups and finance. I was in New York for a long, long time. Um, in 2014, I moved to Singapore and basically took a year off doing nothing but fun, or nothing but like deep learning and fun in that sense, right? Hard deep sense of fun. Right? Um, since 2015, I've been doing kind of a serious natural language processing at a local company here. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have a couple of papers. Um, we're running with Sam, who's the kind of the, the not present guy here, who runs the test, this group with me. Um, we've also been running a developer course. Um, later on, I'll say, well, you know, congratulations on being in, in the TensorFlow group. The Singapore TensorFlow group, according to Meetup, is probably the largest in the world, which is pretty insane for, you know, go Singapore. So, pretty proud of that. So, so. Well, no, it's, 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 it's you. It's you, after all. So, so um, Here's the outline of what I'm talking about. I'm going to talk a little bit about word embeddings. So this is kind of more of a beginner orientated thing. So I'll talk a little bit about word embeddings. I'll talk about adding some context to those. I'll say, I'll mention what a language model is, which was kind of news to me. Um, then talk about this whole fine tuning thing, which is the, the latest trend. And hopefully there will be a demo. Um, though th that depends on Google Colabs, which it may be a bit of a work in progress, but cross fingers. So. So a word embedding, the idea of this is we want to feed words into a network. So this is going right back to the beginning. We will have a sentence, and we want to put this into some neural network. Okay? And we need to translate the sentence into numbers. And so the, the key insight, which came from the 1950s, was that words which, go, which mean the same thing tend to occur in the same contexts. So th the idea here is if we had a huge amount of text, we ran a little window across this text, the stuff which appears together is similar in some sense. And the stuff which appears way apart from it is dissimilar. So maybe we could use this to kind of train something. And so here I've got just a little example of see some source text, the quick brown fox. And here are some training examples. I want there to be some relationship between the and quick and the and brown. And as I slide this window across, this is quick fox, brown fox, fox jumps, fox over. Right? So I, this, this will give me a whole set of training examples which would allow me to say, you know, this stuff is related. And I could even take like, words at random from the rest of the text, saying, well, this stuff is not the same. In all likelihood, it's going to be different. Right? So let's put this into some kind of algorithm. Um, what I want to do is each word, so it could be fox, it could be you know, sits, jumps, space, Singapore, all these words, any word at all, I will give a 300-dimensional vector. So this will essentially be one row in a spreadsheet. I will call every word will have a row in a spreadsheet for it. And I will initially make these all random. So the numbers in this row, they'll probably be like a zero on average, plus or minus one, that kind of number. right? And what I'll do is I'll then slide a window over a huge amount of text where Huge is like a billion words, right? It could be many more, but a billion is a good number to get started with. Um, and what I will do is, for every, words in, every word in the window, I will nudge them towards each other. And then I'll slide the window, and I keep nudging these things. So the, the, the algorithmic details of towards and what that really means, we can leave to the packages. But basically, I'm going to nudge the, the word vectors around until I'm as, a, as unsurprised as possible if I'm given the quick brown something jumps over, I'm quite likely to like the word fox. And I'm un unlikely to want the word tractor. And I'm unlikely to want the word carpet, right? The, 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 uh, these nonsense words don't fit as well as fox does. 
And basically, by nudging these things around, gradually my whole word embedding, this whole spreadsheet of numbers, is going to like hone in on good embeddings. So I'm going to keep iterating this until it's good enough. And the idea is that this whole vector space of words organizes itself. Um, and this, this is without actually telling it anything about the English language, or whatever language, apart from here is a bunch of valid text, like Wikipedia, for instance. So if I run this over Wikipedia, and then I can use something like TensorFlow, which is, I, I haven't got a demo of this, but it's a beautiful thing. Um, basically, this is all the words, or 100,000 words of the English language, projected into three dimensions, so I can kind of spin this around. And if I want to see what's in the neighborhood of the word important, I would get you know, all, all of these nice, like, significant, particular, essential, all the kind of interesting words nearby. This is, is kind of done the job without actually giving it any actual knowledge of English. It's read this thing and unsupervised, it has produced nice vectors. And so this is you know, a beautiful thing from TensorBoard. And there are a couple of nice techniques, one of which is called word to vec So all of these. If you were to go and find my download link, which we'll, we'll post, I think we'll post all the slides in the meetup write up. Um, this has all the links to the papers and code. So in, in Python, there's a nice package called Gensim, which will do word to vec like in a couple of lines of code. You'll be able to either do an embedding from your own text or download a pre existing embedding. Um, and here's, you know, here's their diagram of what, what the word embedding is doing or, or the, the process for it is. And basically, here's, here's all the different words where the cat sat on the mat. It could be the cat ate on the mat or the cat drank on the mat. But there, there's lots of things which the, the, the middle word couldn't be, right? And so basically, the word embedding will do that. This is all in Python, Cython for speed, right? Another popular one is called Glove. Um, Glove is, is a thing which is invented at Stanford. He, there's an important guy under this Pennington et, this inside this et al. There's a guy called Richard Socher, who's at Salesforce. Who's all, you'll see his name. Well, you probably will see him in an et al. later. But he's kind of a key person in terms of the Stanford lectures that you might see on YouTube. Um, now this is 2014. The previous one was 2013. Um, so now you've got a blog post as well as the code. So there's kind of a, a nice thing. Now I've also got some diagrams. And hopefully, so here's what a diagram of, of one, what some of these embeddings look like. If I take, just take the plane through um, these kind of and primary relationships. And the interesting thing is that the, if I take the, the um, direction between man and woman, it's pretty much the same as between sir and madam, and heir and heiress, and king and queen. So it seems that the, the embedding has learnt on its own just something general about gender, which is kind of interesting because it's picked this up without me telling any, you know, that I want to know this thing. Um, similarly, here's another one where it's picked up for, for verbs. Or no, this is for adjectives. So short, shorter, shortest. This kind of this angle thing is a geometric property which is found all on its own amongst all of these things, which these are pretty regular, I guess. Yeah, these are pretty regular. but. It will do this even you know, amongst verbs in their tenses, all this thing. It, it knows all about how stuff works just by reading this billion words or whatever, say Wikipedia. OK, so that's glove. So the good point about word embeddings is it works, and, and things didn't really work before. Um, so that's positive, right? And basically, this allows us to give text as inputs to these models, so we can now do something to text. If we were talking about images, it's pretty obvious what we're doing. We have pixel values. We can feed pixels to, to neural networks. But it was not so obvious what we're going to do with text, which is how we've gone through this whole RNN and you know, all these various other permutations is that people are searching around for good ways of doing this. Um, we can actually train this in a, an unsupervised way. So we didn't have to actually give it any information yet about English or whatever. And we've got tons of data. Um, it's easy to download a Wikipedia just by finding the right link. And you click download um, in Singapore in less than a minute. You'll have six gigabytes of data, whatever. It's like pretty cool. So bad points. Well, one is that you get a 300-dimensional vector. And who's to say what each, each element means? I mean, basically, you can only really compare it against other stuff. This is kind of an opaque meaning here. 
Um, so that troubles some people. It doesn't have to trouble us necessarily. Another problem is that each word has just one vector associated with it. Now, if we talk about, if we think about the word bank, um, if I talk about the word, okay, let's, let's try the word cat. Okay, so the word cat has, apart from the, the usage concatenate, cat is a fairly simple word, right, or dog. But if I talk about bank, it could be a river bank, it could be going to the bank, it could be banking in an aeroplane, all sorts of usage of this, and it's not clear at all where my vector should be in relation. If I said, well, should my bank be close to, like, savings? Oh, yes, it should be. It should definitely be close to my savings, and should it be close to river? Well, it should be close to both. So suddenly you've got some, if by forcing them to both be the same thing, you've got a distortion on your embedding space. So that something weird has got to happen, or maybe we could fix it up somehow. So in order to fix it up somehow, because it's actually quite a big problem, um, one way that people have been looking at it is maybe we could split up into lots of different versions. We could somehow detect that there are different types of bank. But I really don't want to have a dictionary with humans telling me how many versions there are, because that gets away from the whole learn from data thing. Right? Um, I'm going to skip over that, because it, it, it's super difficult. Another thing is to use other data or other models to kind of infer the, the meanings. And another way is to just use more context, because actually when you use the word in a sentence, it's pretty much unambiguous. If I talk about going to the bank, it's clear what I'm doing, right? Un unless I'm in a boat, right, on a river. So using other data. So this is a, a, an idea which is now from just like uh, last August or so, right? So we know that translation models can be pretty good. Um, and fortunately, ambiguous words often have different translations. So in particular, I think, have I got the word now? No, OK. So in, in basically, I, I had prepared a, a nice thing with German, because I, I didn't say the words in German. But the words for German for bank does depend strictly on the meaning, in that the if I'm talking about a river bank, it might be bank. If I'm talking about a, a a uh, checkbook, I'm talking about a casa or something, right? If I'm talking about in an airplane, it's like Hörflug or something. There's some special words for it, which is entirely different in German. So what, if I can f use a language model, which also knows German, it can kind of back inform me about what words I should be using. I could use, am I using the, 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 the airplane kind of word for English, or am I using the, you know, the river word, word in English kind of thing? So I can use those, that kind of knowledge from the translation model to, to create better embeddings on my side, depending on what it's doing in the sentence. And then I can actually just translate. The translation bit's useless. If I don't care about the translation bit. I only cared about the embedding. And then I can then go and use my embedding for whatever I actually wanted to use. So this is a, a nice, this is there. So Richard Socha's hidden in this et al. So, so fortunately, Salesforce bought his startup, so he's not. He's not doing too badly in that et al. So, um, so this is kind of a nice paper where, the, and this is also going back to this encoder decoder, which Hardeep was talking about. Basically, if you have a, a thing which is taking in English and spitting out German, basically, th these, this is your embeddings going in, your pure glove beddings, for instance, embeddings. This thing is trying to attract attention or whatever in the appropriate way to spit out German. But at each point, this, this thing is aligned with the English words, but it has German sensibilities, right? The, the word for bank will also be talking about the, the check bookingness of it in order to attract attention from it when it's outputting the German. So once you've trained this model up to, to run, do a translation, you can then throw away the fact, I don't actually need the translation. I can just use this fact that it's producing this better embedding which is now much more informative about the word bank. So naturally, there's a paper, there's a blog, and there's code, which is in some weird framework. Okay. So now, okay, now let's talk about using more context. Um, it does seem that translating to German is a bit of overkill in as much as now I need a ton of sentences which are in both languages. Um, there's a lot going on there. Why not just use a pure language model? Okay. Now, this is something which kind of took me by surprise. When 
generally we've been talking about models of language in a very broad sense. Here I'm talking about a language model and its only function is if I'm given a phrase, it will predict the next word. And that is the, model, the only model of language which I'm now going to call a language model. Right? That's it. it. Only predict the next word. So if I've got the domestic cat is a small, typically furry. Right? That, that would be a, a nice completion of this thing. Of course. There are more than 70 cat breeds, is probably what you'd say. Right? Um, this talk is extremely boring. Right? This, or this track is, is extremely complicated or easy or Cat, well, cat doesn't seem like a good word in here, unless I said, well, I could be cat orientated, right? I've made the talk more cat orientated than you. If you had the full context of the talk, cat may not be a bad, bad word for here. Depends on how much context I'm going to take. So now language models are receiving more attention because it used to be super difficult to do this one word prediction problem. Now we've got all of these fancy attention models, it's getting a bit easier. Um, but people are beginning to find surprising benefits. So, um, well, one thing we can do is we can train this using tons and tons of data. There's like corpuses of novels and corpuses of all sorts of stuff you can just download. Um, there are lots of new attention techniques, and people have now discovered that fine tuning these models works unfairly well. And the kind of the phrase unfairly well would also apply to ImageNet, for instance. ImageNet being the big image competition, it apparently. It's been proven that learning how to do that well has had huge impacts on, say, radiography, which isn't, you hasn't been trained for that, but these models are extremely good to train over to these other domains. So we can essentially leverage other people's trained models in other domains. So this actually works for language, so this is the thing. So what we do, and this is, so I, there's a, okay, I'm getting onto these other models. So. We'll take an existing pre-trained language model, which we'll take, I'll show you three. So um, what you do is you take an a, a classifier for your task. So your task could be, I want to detect the sentiment of this complaint, or I want to detect um, what the parts of speech are, or I want to detect whether my product is mentioned, or all sorts of things, okay? Um, but for this, I want to then train these weights very, very quickly because this is only a very, there's a very big model which is providing me knowledge of English and I'll then be able to train my small classifier using all of this kind of machinery um, on very, very small, like, wind, like a very small extra knowledge that, that it's needed. And so what this has led to is the sudden breaking of multiple state-of-the-art kind of records. So. Um, the, the picture here is you take a full language model, which is trained on just huge amounts of English. You then take your, in this case, this is IMDb. So this will be a movie reviews. You'll take your, the language in your movie reviews and just kind of fine tune it a bit so that the language model now talk, knows more about movies than just general English. And then you go on to this sentiment thing, which is your, your movie review orientated classifier. So you fine tune a rather big thing um, but you, you haven't got to label data until the very last stage. So this is a model, actually called Emma, ELMO, which came out in February. Um, because it, this is this year, they've now got blog, and they've got code in TensorFlow, and it's now a TensorFlow Hub module, and there's some other code, and there's a tutorial. So this is, um, you know, this is a, a groundbreaking paper. Um, when they started to talk about this whole fine-tuning or improving word embedding things. Um, this is a diagram of a diagram of a diagram, right? So basically, they're taking your input sentence, they're passing it through some LSTMs, like a whole bunch of them, and at the top of this, they'd have a, lang a thing which just predicts the next um, one. I think Michael just took a, a picture of the picture of the picture of the picture. Right? So, so Basically, there's a language model on top of all of this, which is, enables you to train all of these weights. What you, but you don't have to train all the. They've trained these weights. So, and the, the ELMO vector for each of these things, you just take like these middling states and you just add them all up with, with some little parameters, right? You just kind of superpose all these things, and that's a much better embedding than the embedding f that you started with, because it takes the context from the entire sentence um, in both directions and Basically, it's certified to be a good idea. Um, and also, there's this thing on 
TF Hub, which is kind of Google's new way of distributing not just a model, but it's a model with, with data and like test stuff, all, all this nice stuff, all, all built into something which you can then reuse and compose with other models. So this, with two, two lines of Python, you can do that big model and just use its outputs and pretend it's a black box. So that's kind of neat. Um, but that was February, right? So, so now there's another catchly one, another one, which is they published the paper in January, but they didn't really kind of pile behind it until May, called Almfit. Um, this is the people from Fast.ai, which have a, a, some good videos. It's kind of, um, they have a, a particular way of thinking as well, but they have, this is nice research. Um, and of course, there's a blog, there's code, that, somehow it's not really relevant here and they've got um 400 megabyte models which you can download and they're encouraging like open source people to contribute more models in their own languages i don't know whether that works or not but um but basically they this is from their paper they say well this is the pre-trained model then you do a bit of fine tuning with your own kind of language samples so even if you don't have any labels you just stuff your Suppose I wanted, you know, uh, movie reviews in Singlish. I just pile in tons of Singlish in here, which will kind of get it to understand a few more extra words and a few more nuances of, you know, on the light, whatever. That, that you would understand some of these things uh, more than the standard English model would. And then instead of having this language model, I then build this very small classifier, which would say, is this a good review or is this a negative review? Um, and so going through these three stages, well, this one I can do for free. This one I don't need, I need massive data. Well, I can do massive data, but I don't need massive label data. And then this one, I can use a fairly small sample because I'm leveraging all the rest. And this is shown to work pretty well. Um, so they basically they use, here's the number of training examples you need. If you did a model from scratch, your model with 100 training examples would be terrible, right? It, as, as you go up to 200 or 20,000 examples, now you're talking that you can train from scratch, but it's still totally worse than if you take one of these pre-built models and fine-tuned it. And this one is if you've used unlabeled data and labeled data with just 100 samples, you can do pretty well. And so this is, a, this is kind of a t the turning point where oh, oh, this, this um, transfer learning works for text pretty well now. So now here's the, the paper which uh, Hardeep talked about. Um, I'm definitely not going to explain this in this context, but basically this is magic in here, and they have 12 sets of this magic. Um, and this enables them to build a language model. And on top of that, you can add any little classifiers that you like. And this allows them to do all of these different tasks. Um, naturally, they've got blog and code in, in TensorFlow, which is great, and they've got pre-trained models. Um, and other stuff, um, and they get great results. So here's, here's a whole bunch of data sets um, where the previous state of the art here, I don't know, let's pick this one, rock stones, it's rock stories, okay. Previous state of the art is 77.6, which people have been working at for years to like eke out 0.1 of a percent kind of thing. Um, they can suddenly beat it by another 8% in one go. So this is a huge improvement over state-of-the-art results in one sweep um, using one model, which is kind of insane. Um, they've got some nice blog posts. So. so the other thing which they mentioned, which I thought was neat, is some tricks. So instead of fine, and I quite like tricks, so instead of fine-tuning the model, which is a good thing to do, but does sound like hard work, um, you can do a little black magic, right? The idea here is just use the language model to rate the problem statements. So let me, let me explain that. So the, here's the trick for sentiment. The normal problem for a sentiment is the review would be, I loved this movie. And the question, is this positive, right? So I'd build a classifier to do that, right? The trick is I give it two, I give it two different reviews. I give this to my language model. I say, I love this movie, very positive, and I love this movie, very negative, okay? And I just use the language model to say which of these is the more likely sentence. Now, if my la language model is, 
is super good, it would know that the first sentence is wholly more likely than the second sentence. And so there is my, my movie review sentiment analyzer in one trick without training anything. I've, I've used the off-the-shelf sentiment thing and I've got results straight away. Okay. So here's another trick with a thing called Winograd problems. So Winograd problems are like, the fish ate the worm, it was tasty. So what was it? Is it the fish or was it the worm? Right? And the trick is you say, well, the fish ate, well, I'm just going to do a substitution for the, the it here. So I, I'm interested in what, what was tasty. I'm going to substitute the fish or the worm as being it. So the fish ate the worm, the fish was tasty. The fish ate the worm, the worm was tasty. And I'm going to pass that into my language model. And if my language model is super duper, then it will know which one of these is most likely. Um, and, there's, and we know that this is a really good method because there's a Google paper, um, a simple method for common sense reasoning, which came out which, with code and... Anyway, I will explain that. Sorry. And basically, the, the Winograd problems are really difficult for computers to do. And so people were coming up with databases of knowledge, um, like common sense. They had all this kind of schema for building knowledge um, and were scoring like 53% of these right, which maybe is not great if you've got a, two options, right? It's like not great. Some of them got three options, but, you know, two options is not good. Um, on the other hand, they came along and just did this language model thing, and it scores in, in the 60s. I mean, this is a wholly much better way of doing it, except you just have to have tons of data. So earlier today, we downloaded this saying, oh, great, TensorFlow, I can do this. Um, but there's a 200 gigabyte download of model because it's an ensemble of massive amounts of Google-ish models. Um, so I'm not going to do that in Colabs right now. So this does really work, um, but you know, at Google scale, so far, so far. So. OK, so now I'm going to do a demo. Um, if it works, thank that guy. If it doesn't, then it's, it's Google's fault. Right? So. <laughs> oh, OK, that's a good, that's a good. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so in, in case, ooh. okay. So do, do I need to rerun everything? Or, no, it's okay. okay. So basically, um, if you haven't seen this, this is Google Colabs. It's free. Um, one of the nice things with it being free um, is it's also got a GPU already attached. So this is, everyone in this room essentially has a GPU available to them, um, but only for 12 hours at a time. After 12 hours, the machine dies, okay, at least, or more frequently. Um, but for those, as long as you can be saving your checkpoints somewhere else, you have a beautiful thing, right? Um, my guess is that Google has got data centers already set up for these things for four years ago, but now these TPUs have come along, all this stuff, they have spare capacity, right? So this is a huge resource for, for running models. And basically, I've got the OpenAI language model. Basically, there's code online. You can download it. It should be easy. Um, so I'm just basically this. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I have the OpenAI model um, basically laid out in, in just in one long flow. So there's some kind of initialization stuff, some encoding stuff for these data sets. Da, 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 da. Flatten, and then, then they actually start to, this is average grads, okay, so here, here's some data, which apparently is already in there. Um, so I'm going to download both a sentiment data set and a Winograd data set. So there's some pre-processing, um, there's some Winograd schema thingies, da, 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 and here's the model. So the model, basically they've written this all out in full, so instead of using libraries, They've actually written it out, like here's what how Adam works, or, which is so. This, if you're just beginning, rest assured that this stuff is all stuffed away in libraries you can use in a one-liner. Um, for some reason, OpenAI has made it super open and won't even trust Google to remain uh, set solid. So anyway, um, so there's a whole that they define attention and all these things. Um, ba -ba, ba -ba. 
on the other hand, th this, this attention model, so this is the um, transformer model which Hardeep explained, which is you know, black magic times 12, um, it, is, it is fully defined in this file, right? It's, it's not as if I've paged through hundreds of thousands of lines of code. There's maybe 100 lines of code or maybe 200 at the most. It fully defines the model, even though it's state of the art in, in you know, many, many ways. Um, this is written out in like very basic operations. So having done that, I can then s s do some initialization, load in some parameters, and I can then do this sentiment classification task. And basically, um, we, wrote, we wrote a function which says that this thing can get 67% accuracy on this thing without any, this is just using the trick. So this is not using any fine tuning or anything. Um, we also have a, uh, here's basically how the tricks works. I loved this movie, I hated this movie. Um, basically, this little, little function here, and so this code is a, will be available like tonight in my GitHub or whatever. Um, basically, this is taking the, taking the language model, and then it'll taking the logits, which will be the last step of the model, and it's just saying, is the, that logit suggesting more for the word positive or for the word negative? So it's just rating, if I say the word very at the end of my review, would I say the next word as being more positive or more negative? So doing this will actually, you know, actually do reviews for me. Like, you, know, you can play with this yourself. It's like interesting. Similarly, for Winograd, we can do a whole bunch of things. So hopefully you can see this. So if we, just, if we do write a whole bunch of little tests here, the cat sat on the mat has a, so this is a loss. So lower is better, right? So this is a loss of five-ish. The dog sat on the mat, it actually likes it more, which I don't understand how it would be a dog person. The mat sat on the dog, on the other hand, is much less likely. And then mat the on do, sat dog the, right, is very unlikely. So this, basically, it's showing that the language model understands what, what a good sentence is, what a bad sentence is, and it understands that, it understands that mats don't sit on dogs. So this is kind of interesting. And then this can go, there's basically, if you have a look at it, these are the Winograd problems kind of laid out for the substitution trick. And you can actually see charts of um, ba -ba -ba, fish, the fish ate the worm, the fish was hungry. Okay. So basically, this will give you maps of whether it's more likely to say the word fish or the word worm in all of these things. So this allows you to explore. Um, the things, and it's quite easy to use. I mean, I could just press run. This is a, um, I, I really don't do it, but it, there's one cell which is loading Spacey, which is the, like a, a language, li an excellent language library in Python. But apart from that, th this thing runs, you know, it's, it's a five minute job. So you can quite easily click on the, the link, which will load this in Colab. You click on the GPU. You can run this thing and just see it live. Um, so that is a nice demo from that guy. That guy. Right. Okay, so wrap up. Am I wrapping up? No. Ah, for your problem. Okay. So the old way of dealing with your problem is you build a whole model, you use some glove embeddings, you train it, and you need tons of data. The new way, and this has kind of come to the fore in the last couple of months, is you take a pre-trained language model, you fine-tune it on your own data, and this data needn't have labels. It's just like get, to get a feel for the language you're going to be using. And then you train on label data. So this could be a much smaller data set. Um, you don't need so much data, and you can expect kind of better results. So that's kind of the trend. So to wrap up, suddenly this transfer learning works for text. Um, good models are available. You can just download them, well, particularly in English. If you're in Chinese, we have yet another intern working on that problem. So this is, is something which can be tackled. Um, if we go to more esoteric languages, it's going to be harder to get the data. But this is a very doable thing. These are quite generic kind of uh, problems people took. But the, pro the models are pretty big. Um, so for, for the Elmo thing, or sorry, the Ulmfit thing, we're talking about 400 meg. But this will just sit in memory, churning away with less than a gig, right? Um, for the Microsoft, sorry, sorry, damn, I said that. For the Google one, that's a 200 gig kind of 
problem, um, that may be more of a challenge, particularly on my laptop. So, um, so I have a repo. I'll, I'll leave a link for all the... We'll, we'll all leave links for the slides, and there'll be a link to my code. Um, my um, KPI for this is probably... Please add a star if you, if you like it. Um, and so that's, that's me done. But, but I've got some uh, little ads. So this is the TensorFlow Meetup group. And since you're here, you know about it. Um, the next one's probably going to be like the early, mid-July. But we'll have to see whether that can be coordinated. Um, Sam will be back for that, so that cross fingers. Um, hopefully, you found, if you're just starting out, there's been something interesting for you. Um, hopefully. If you're like following every little tweet about every paper, there's also something for you. Um, and we've also got a lightning talk. So that guy, wherever he is, unless he ran away, should ah, this guy's got a talk. So this is a demonstration that it can happen. Um, one thing I should mention is there's some Google news in the last week. Um, they've come up with some GPU news in that they've now got these new preemptible prices. So f this is saying for less than, a, less than a dollar, so this is less than a sing dollar an hour, you can get one of these V100 GPUs, which is an insanely fast thing or for, from NVIDIA. Um, for less than a dollar is pretty good. Uh, it may be taken away from you, but as long as you're saving checkpoints, you don't really care. You just get another one. Right? So, um, so that's good. Um, and even better news is that they've started releasing these TPUs, which is their own silicon for doing for computation, which is at, at you know two less than two US an hour. These things may be a rough factor. These things are like fifteen times faster than a ten eighty Ti, right? So if you can coordinate the flow of data, which is the main problem, into this thing, the actual floating rate performance of this could be doing your models 15 times faster than your desktop GPU. Um, clearly, they can scale this into massive size. Um, you will also be paying the money, um, but this, this is pretty cool. Um, now, some people have been asking, there's been a deep, deep learning developer course that Sam and I have been running. Um, we did one last September. Um, we're going to do another, another run, basically like this September, August, September October, November. Um, the first module of this we've been calling Jumpstart. And I'm not sure people have connected that this is, this is like the first part of that module to get everyone going. Um, now, with, within the deep learning, the long course, the long course last year was eight weeks, twice a week, involved projects. It was kind of exhausting. Hardeep was one of those people who, well, ask him whether it can improve your job prospects right, and stuff. He, he enjoyed it, I think. So, um, so there's a, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, one of the key factors there is making sure the Singapore government can help Singaporeans and PRs. So we're working on that. Um, there is this first. This is the first module of the jump. De sorry, of the full developer course. We've run one of these. We're probably going to run one more in July. We, we are running one more in July. There are probably be one more at the beginning of the September full thing. But this is the kind of the first module of it. Um, is two weekdays plus some nights. You get to play with real models. But the key point, which people didn't realize really when they came, is you'd have to do your own project. So it's not that there's kind of coursework and, you know, can you get a, a grade from us according to the grader, which is fine for Coursera or whatever. But this is more like here is your own project, something that you care about. When you go to an employer or you know, your next employer or your current employer say, I built this, you actually did build it. It wasn't that it was kind of pre-made for you and you filled in some blanks, or it wasn't that you were in a team who, and you were the guy who fetched the coffee and everyone else built the model, right? So th this is, a, this is a, a good opportunity to, to build your own thing, and we can try and make it work, and that, that will be a key learning. But, you know, clearly the full developer course, it gets, you know, harder and deeper. So there we go. All right, that's me. Thank you. And let's head for the next guy.